So I'm here today with um, Patrick Olunik, who's the CEO of Endreams. Patrick, thanks for joining. My pleasure. Nice to be here, Bob. Yeah. So, um, so you're coming to us from London. What's you know you gotta you, anything you do now you gotta start out talking about the coronavirus, right? So, <laughs> what's it like in London, and has it affected your team, and how are you guys working through this? We've been really lucky, actually. I mean, we were worried about it we prepared pretty early and actually we're we're getting 95 percent of the work done that we would do in the office so it's actually working pretty well uh for a few people it obviously it's hard if you're in a small tiny flat and you haven't got many friends and family around and you moved over from another european country for example it's difficult uh or if you've got very young kids it's really hard to get as much work done but we're doing well we're on track all the projects are running well all of you know our milestones are going well everything's on track so we're, we're very very lucky to be honest with you and how do the how do the employees feel about it? Have you you check in with them? How are they like yeah. it? Yeah, it or uh, we do, and we're trying to do as much as we can. So we you know we sent fruit baskets around to everybody, and we send them birthday cake. It's their birthday, and we're trying to do fun things and competitions and games to try and keep everyone as positive as they can be. Actually, everyone's doing really well, pretty much. Um, we're in a we're in a good place. Um, I think one or two of them would quite like to stay here afterwards as they have a commute into work that takes them an hour or more. And I can imagine them uh, being quite happy not doing that if they can. Yeah, it's amazing how much lost productivity there is. You know, in America, I've done some research and it's like $690 billion a year lost productivity in commuting wow. in the US. A and it's a big number. And, and global CEOs are, are you know, looking at the potential cost savings of office space and stuff like that, I think you're going to see you're going to see some balance between telecommuting and working from home and going to the office. And we're probably going to see things change. Have you guys thought about that yet? Or are you too busy working for a deadline? Uh, we've been discussing that this week, actually. I think it's it's about what is it going to be like afterwards. And I think we will definitely be more willing to take on remote programmers and artists and designers uh, whereas before we might have gone oh, I'm not sure it would work they kind of need to be here with the team you know face to face and actually we're proving it can work pretty well so I think that argument is is less valid in the future so hopefully it means we can go after you know recruiting people from anywhere in the world doesn't yeah. matter whether uh, doesn't matter if they can't come to our office uh, if they're great and talented we can we can hire them so I think that would be a very positive thing for us and also that means we don't need quite so much office space maybe we don't need to take a a third floor maybe we can stick with with what we've got so that's quite positive yeah and it's interesting too because i've always talked about vr you know ultimately being the thing that breaks down borders and brings people closer together but you know this this whole kind of remote telework now building teams cross-functional teams cross-border teams is the is going to be the new thing and and it's going to really help bring the world closer together yeah, we, we've done some really fun stuff in VR remotely. Um, we had, uh, for example, we did a little virtual, uh, really nice piece of virtual world tech, and we had the artists all together in VR going through an environment, going through a level, pointing at textures and geometry and saying, oh, that texture needs to be better, and we need to rework that. But they were all walking through it together in the virtual world, waving and gesticulating and pointing stuff out. And that was amazing. It was the best way of reviewing level geometry is in 3D inside the level and it's that kind of stuff is just going to get more and more powerful i think how are you using vr for collaboration differently now that you guys are disconnected than you would have if you were all in the same building um we were we were we were using it a little bit actually even before the lockdown we're still doing some we're not doing as much as we should do it's not like we all jump into vr and have team meetings every day, but it is being used collaboratively uh, a, a bit on, on this particular project. And, uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we, we use VR in the design and development process as well, you know, for things like level design, it's such a powerful tool for quickly creating geometry and figuring out where things should be placed rather than using a 2D, you know, a screen. So um, we're, we're definitely seeing VR come into the whole production more and more as time goes goes along not just in terms of the you know the end result and playing the game but how we develop it that's awesome now you guys shifted towards vr all the way back in what 2013 <laughs> yeah a very long time ago we got in well, early why like seriously like why what was what was the thinking at the time that led you to make that shift do you know what it was it was really purely passion. Um, we had been in this thing called PlayStation Home, which was a virtual world that runs on the PS3. And we'd been doing that with Sony for a long time. We became the biggest global publisher. It was a great place to be. But we were a 
a big fish in a small pond. It wasn't going to go anywhere. It wasn't getting bigger. And we were figuring out our next move. Um, and then I saw the DK1, I saw Palmer and Brendan, you know, demoed it. And I, uh, and I just fell in love with that. And then fortunately, because we were, we were working with Sony, we got a sneak look at their Morpheus prototype, which then became PSVR. And you know what? I just fell in love with it. I'd seen VR maybe 20 years earlier in the Trocadero in London, one of these big kind of places where you, I can't remember what headset it was. called it the VR Vortec. And that was, yeah. I helped launch that product. I worked for Global VR. I was, I was the head of corporate that, business development. Perfect. So I remember it vividly. And, and that is 2000. Yeah. And this thing, I, I don't know, you may know this actually. There was a little demo where you're a baby and you're crawling along the floor in this kitchen and this mum is walking and the scale was, you know, it was incredible. Scale's brilliant in VR. And, and that's, that stuck with me, that little 30 second moment from the 1990s. Yeah. Um, and then when I saw the DK1 and the, the, the Morpheus prototype, I just kind of went, you know what? This is not a gimmick. This is something that if done properly, it's an emotion amplifier. It makes emotion, you know, emotions are so much more powerful in VR because you forget you're in the real world. So we went, right, that's it. You know, we are going to be specialists in this, this uh, place. Let's just go all in. Um, and that's been a long journey and it's taken a long time to get to where we are now and, and a you know, commercial uh, market for VR as well, which has taken a while to grow. But uh, it's been a fantastic seven years since we started and we've learned so much. Yeah. And so speaking of commercial market, it, you know, how do you feel about it? What, what, how are you feeling about you know, the last 12 months, starting to see some traction. We'll talk a little bit about inside out headsets too, but in general, how are you feeling about the commercial opportunity in, in VR gaming? I think I'm even more bullish than I, I ever have been, to be honest with you. I mean, you sort of have to split it in two, the consumer market and the LBE market. Um, because obviously at the moment with everything that's going on, they're, they're two very, very different um, places. Um, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm super bullish. I'm, I'm a real believer that all of the big tech companies see this end goal and they see this end goal, whether it's three years or five years or eight years of a pair of lightweight Ray-Ban size, AR, VR glasses, stream over 5G, all the processing is done on the cloud and you just use them for everything. You use them for AR, for navigation, you don't use your phone and you use them for VR and the most powerful immersive experiences. And I think they all, I really do believe everyone is working towards that. They're all solvable problems, but they have still lots of stuff has to be solved to get there. And, and, and I, you know, the Quest in particular is for me a hugely revolutionary point. I don't know anybody who's bought a Quest who isn't in love with it. It's such a great step up in terms of being wireless, being able to do it any way you want. It just works beautifully. Um, and VR has to have hand tracking, uh, motion control. It has to have six degrees of freedom to work well for me. And, and so it's the first proper wireless VR headset. And, and it's exciting. I think it heralds where the future is going. Um, and, you know, Sony have obviously done very well PSVR. We're, you know, very uh, hopeful and confident that they will continue to trailblaze in VR in the future. And then, you know, with Valve and other companies doing some great stuff, it's a, it's a very vibrant space. And the numbers are getting good now. We're seeing multiple million units selling VR games. You know, uh, Beat Saber's done over two million units. It, it's a, it's, that's a pretty impressive milestones. Yeah. And now you mentioned, you, you know, you mentioned um, Valve. And, and so I want to ask you about Half-Life, Alex. Um, you know, what did you guys think of it? What does the team think of it? Um, assuming you've played it. We loved it. I mean, it's a fantastic game. Uh, I wish we had the budget that they had to create a VR game. Uh, I would really enjoy working on that. Uh, but it's, it's incredible. A lot of this, you know, it, it's, uh, it's certainly, for me, the best VR game that's been created to date. They've done it beautifully. They've done it incredibly well. It demonstrates why VR is so good. It drives me crazy when you see people go, oh, let's do a 2D version, a port of it. It's like, no, you can't port a game design for VR to non-VR, you fools. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, it's great. There's some really clever stuff in there. It uses VR very well. Um, it's, you know, and I think it's, every, it's, it's about the package. Every bit of it is really polished and beautifully put together. I'm not sure it's utterly revolutionary and it doesn't do loads and loads of stuff that you've never seen before but you know what everything it does it brings it together in the most beautiful high quality polished triple a sort of uh, vision and and yeah we would love it really really good and, and i think it's going to inspire lots of vr games in the future and show people that you know what vr can be like we're we're dreaming of the point where vr budgets are in the tens and 20 million you know development and ultimately 100 million you know so you're making the same kind of size VR games as Red Dead Redemption and Call of Duty and the budgets that go into traditional games. At the moment, they're not quite there, but we are seeing a few games between 10 and 20 million. Um, 
And I think Half-Life Alex gives you a brilliant example of what's possible when you do have that kind of budget. And you'll see more and more of those games coming as the market continues to grow. Was there anything in that game that inspired your team where you were, you know, because you're in the middle of a development cycle or probably towards the end of a development cycle, I imagine now. Um, yeah. Anything in there they looked at and they said, oh, let's do this or wish we had done this or... No, I mean, I think the t- <laughs> we did look at it and look at all the things we love in there. And I think what it does very well for me is the way it uses physics so nicely with VR. VR and physics just work beautifully together. And I love... And we're doing this a bit in Phantom, actually. I love games where players can come up with their own solutions that the designers haven't come up with. And I felt that, that in Half-Life, you know, you grab a bucket, put all the grenades in the bucket, drag it round and go, ah, I've got a mobile inventory. I, was like, I didn't think of that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of works, uh, actually, quite well. And, you know, that, it's not obvious. I'm not told to do that, but that's using physics to be smart. And, and I think there's... That physics is brilliant at that, and Half-Life does that well. We do that a little bit in Phantom. I mean, even in one of our earliest demos, actually, we, we, we had somebody shoot a bad guy, um, use the ore to grab his body, float it to him, put an explosive on the back, pushed him away down the river towards the enemy guards, and then set off the explosive. And sort of, nobody ever designed a body to be a sort of explosive carrying device, um, <laughs> but it just kind of worked. It was quite a cool trick. And I, I love it where people can use the gameplay, can use the game mechanics to... Um, to come up with solutions that you know the game designers never came up with, and Half Life Alex does that really well. Yeah, and so let's t- let's talk about y- your new game. So um, you've released, you've you've announced a release date. Is it June twenty five? I think that's right. Yeah, it's not long now. We've got a couple of months. Yeah, and so I first of all, I want to thank you for taking the time because I know that towards the end of a development cycle, it can get it can get a little bit nutty. Um, I'm fascinated by the kayak locomotion, um, you know, mechanic and. Yeah. And so I thought I'd seen every locomotion mechanic you know, <laughs> that could be possibly invented already. And, and so here you come along. What was your inspiration for that? So it was primarily we started off going, right, let's prototype really quickly lots of different cool things that we think would be interesting in VR, including locomotion, because clearly running around at top speed in VR is not a comfortable uh, way of moving. So how can we give you... F- ideally free roam around an environment. So you're not on a spline or you're not stuck in place. Um, and we played with a lot of stuff actually. And one of them was, um, actually we started off doing a rolling a ball like that with your hands, kind of rolling it and rolling it backwards. And that was quite fun. And then we went, well, actually, you know, how about a, a kayak or an aura song? Let's see how that works. And we tried lots of stuff. And do you know what? It was just so fun and so easy paddling around. And it, because you kind of know how, a, how an all works, you know, you kind of know if you push it in the left, you turn. Um, the, the challenge has been getting the balance right between completely new users who've never been in a kayak before and Olympic kayak experts, of which we've had somebody play the game, uh, you know, who expects it to be absolutely perfect. Um, but I think we've got a really good compromise there. Um, and it's nice because it's just so easy. You don't, what I love about Phantom, and I think this is quite important for VR design in general, is um, the everything being very intuitive. You don't need to know that this particular button does this or that, you know, if you do that, this happens. It's, it's a lack of abstraction, I guess. So you look down and you see an oar and you reach and you pick it up and you grab it and you paddle. So it's all about the grab and the move and that's it. You don't really need to use any buttons at all other than grab. And so you see there's a gun at your chest, you pick it up and then there's a trigger, you pull it, oh, it works, great. And everything in the game is like that. There's no special buttons that you need to press. There's no uh, you know, menus and UIs. Everything's in 3D in the world. Everything kind of feels right and authentic. And I think that's quite an important element of VR design because it helps with the immersion. You lose yourself in the world because you haven't got menus and buttons that do different things. You're just reaching and grabbing like you would in the real in real. It also makes it more accessible to people who don't identify as console gamers, PC gamers, yeah. or whatever. You know, because I know, like, for me to pick up and lo- learn a control scheme, and now that I've put my controller down for the last ten or fifteen years, I'm just like, ah, I can't be bothered. But <laughs> you know, but picking up a couple of controllers and going in and just playing like it's the real world has gotten me reinvigorated about gaming when I thought I would never play again. And so, yeah, I think it's going to open up a whole. You know, once we get the hardware more accessible, then I think it's going to blow open the doors to a whole new generation of, 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 or many generations of gamers, maybe. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's what I love about the VR control system. You don't, you know, you can't have lots of buttons on the controller because, you, you know, it's, it's hard to look, you can't look down, obviously you can do it in game, but 
the very best way of doing VR, I think, is almost just to use the trigger and the grab buttons and that's it, you know, and you just reach and grab and do stuff. And I love the power of that. I think it's, it, it makes it, as you say, very, very accessible for people. Just stick in the headset, don't tell them anything, and they're just off. Yeah, that's, it, it's awesome. And so, and so um, when, you, when you get into this now, like, so you've designed a mechanic, it sounds like you've like you designed the mechanic and then did you wrap a game around it? Yeah, yeah, literally. We found that was the best. I've always found in my years in the industry that actually having something really special as a sort of foundation is the best way to design a game. You've got something that's great fun. Um, you know, when I made a driving game, it worked really well. We just have a little driving prototype without any of the complexity. And it was just a real laugh, sliding around corners, dodging past cars. And if you've got that little bit of magic, I think everything else has got a great foundation to go on. With Phantom, we had the navigation, the moving around, it just works. And then we went, well, why, you know, would it be a Olympics kayak racing game? Okay, we could do that. Oh. So it's exactly. <laughs> um, or, although actually when they go back and, you know, up and around things, it's, it's kind of interesting. And then we read about these um, Navy SEALs and sort of F the SBS in the UK. There's the SAS that you've probably heard of, the Special Forces. There's also the SBS, the Special Boat Service. And these guys in World War II, and even now, do go out in kayaks for missions because they're super silent. There's no engines. They're the best way to sneak into waterlogged places. So we've got pictures of, of people actually doing this for real. And we kind of went, oh, that would be amazing. How good would that be? So the whole game is set in this kind of Eastern European waterlogged um, uh, base that the, this terrorist group have taken over. And there's, you know, water everywhere. So it's a perfect way to get around and navigate. Um, and, it, and it's got a cool theme and a great story to it. And, and it works quite well. Yeah, interesting. So, so, so what was the inspiration? So you, you, you realize the SBS and because it's a stealthy thing, then naturally you figured you know, a, a, a stealth mission is the natural follow on to that discovery? Yes, I think so. And also we did, again, a bit more prototyping and there's, there's this magical moment we love uh, right at the beginning, early on in Phantom, where, you know, you're under a walkway and you paddle under a walkway and you stop there and you see a guard walking above you and you can mm. see through the slats in the woods, his foot and his torch. Um, and you're kind of, you're being quiet and you're underneath this guy. And that moment of, oh my God, I don't want to make a noise. There's a guard there. He's really dangerous. I'm, I'm hiding. I'm sneaking past in the reeds. There's something really great about that. And we always love stealth games. So I think for us, it was a natural fit. The, uh, you know, stealth gives you that emotion. It's again, it comes back to emotion amplification. You know, I love giving emotions in games. The easiest emotion, lowest hanging fruit is probably horror. So you've yeah. seen a lot of horror games in VR because it's great, it's very easy to scare people and it works very well. Um, but I think you'll see more and more advanced games bringing in other types of emotion. And for us, that, that feeling of intention when you've got guards all around you and you're sneaking through in a stealth game is great. And I'm, there's lots of other ones, you know, I'm sure we'll see love for AI, AI characters and, and, you know, and lots of other really great emotions coming through. The, the, I remember the feeling of awe I got when I first played the Tomb Raider games. You come out of a tiny tunnel and you see these amazing vistas. And I think that kind of feeling of awe and magic in VR is going to be even more powerful as well. I remember playing Splinter Cell. I was a big um, Tom Clancy Splinter Cell fan. And I remember the tension just playing it, you know, with a precision <laughs> halfway across the room on a television. I can't imagine what this is going to be like in VR. It's, I'm really yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah, particularly when you've got dangerous enemies and you can't just, you know, we've tried to make it so that you get some action and you do get to shoot and go a bit crazy. But also it, the game is, is hard if you do that. The very best way to play the game is to balance that with stealth and tension. And, and actually you can get through every level without um, uh, killing an enemy. And if, it's, it can be hard to do, but that's the, the ultimate way to play the game. Yeah. Now, how long is the game designed to be? Have you said that? Um, I don't think I've done a final playthrough, but it's certainly, um, I think it's six to eight hours, depending on how long you play. There's quite a lot of replayability in there as well. So it's a proper game. There's a lot to it. And I know you can go back. But we've got challenges in there, and I think there's DLC coming as well. So what the game is on day one won't necessarily be what you've got in a few months' time. So we're hoping to grow and expand what we will be growing and expanding the game over time and more content, I think. Yeah, and I think you'd announce that there's going to be um, global leaderboards too. And so are you thinking about, like, does this play in the esports place world or what's your thinking around that? I don't know. We haven't set out to make an esports game. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a single player game, which is a, a strong narrative and then some great challenges and replayability within that. 
certainly not impossible. And we'd love to make a multiplayer version of it. Uh, you could imagine two or four of you going down together using hand signals. Come on, go over there. Um, or even competitive, where you're, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to take each other out. It would be really fun. So uh, let's see where we go in the future. But for now, this is a, you know, we're just trying to make a really high quality, you know, uh, single player game. That's great. Now, you, you know, you've talked a lot about budgets and, and you know, and, and how much it costs to make a big AAA game like Alex. Um, yeah. And you guys are working with Oculus Studios and, you know, they're publishing the game, I take it, is from a relationship standpoint. You know, how much has that helped? Could you do this without that support from them? Like, what the, kind of the business environment now to build a game like this? What's it been like and, and how's it been working with Oculus? Well, it's, you know, it's been brilliant working with them. They've been really supportive. Um, they've helped a lot with ideas and tech and all sorts of stuff. Um, we couldn't have done this game without them. You know, the, the, the challenge we've got as a VR developer um, is that when we started this game, which is quite a long time ago, you know, we could have afforded a game, maybe if we were funding it ourselves, an eighth of the size, a tenth of the size. So to make something that's properly high quality, and we wanted to demonstrate what we can do, you know, we're aiming we'll see where we do. Well, we want to get, you know, nine out of 10 reviews if we can. We want this to be something really special. And that was the goal right from the beginning. And that requires a certain budget to really do something great. And, and the, the fantastic thing about Oculus is they've helped us do a game of this scale and this size and show off what we can do. And, and we wouldn't have been able to do that with, without them. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time and money getting a prototype, a playable demo together, um, which I think convinced them that this was going to work really well. Um, but they've been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And we talk to them every week and they're supportive, you know, not only with development and the team, but also with uh, with marketing and production and PR. And you'll, you'll probably see a bit of that next week, actually, with some interesting stuff that's going to start happening next week. So Oculus have been brilliant to work with. Um, and it's just, it just makes it so easy when your starting point is an Oculus Quest, which is, as I say, genuinely the best VR headset I've ever used. It's just brilliant. And it's a, it's a great joy to play it every time. Now, did you, did you guys start out thinking this was a Rift only title and then when Quest came out, add Quest? <laughs> um, yeah, when we first did the demo for the game, we assumed it would be Rift only because we, we weren't aware of the Quest. We didn't know anything about it. So um, yes, that was, that was a challenge. And, and I would say to developers, doing a photo real game, which Phantom is you know, kind of trying to do is, is a challenge on the Oculus Quest. Um, I think it's been a great challenge for us because you know what? I'm so proud of what we've achieved. And I hope when you see the, the quest build of the game, which is identical, other than, you know, graphic, obviously graphics are pushed up on the Rift, but the entire gameplay experience, all of the tools, all of the gadgets, everything you do, the missions are identical on Quest. And I'm really proud of how hard we've pushed the Quest hardware. And I kind of think we're probably pushing it more than anybody else. It'd be really interesting to see what people think when they play the final build, but it was hard. It was hard work. And I think it would have been much easier for us if we'd have done a cell shaded game or something yeah. that was cartoon based. So we sort of made a rod for our own back and it's been hard work, really hard work, you know, optimizing and getting it to hit the, the, the frame rate that you need to be smooth is, is tough actually, but it's a, it's, it, we, we've got that. Now you guys, are, you're super bullish on all in one headsets and, and so talk a little bit about that and where do you see that going? And, um, you know, I think you called, you called the, you know, Oculus Quest VR version two, actually. Um, so where do you see that going? What are you looking forward to in, in the, on the tech side? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think the Quest works so well because it's not tethered to a PC or tethered to your PlayStation. Um, it doesn't require you booting stuff up and getting cables plugged in like it might with a, a you know, a, a PlayStation VR, for example, or a Vive. So I think it just makes that friction of, I want to play a game. And you just go and you grab your headset and you stick it on. Actually, that's my riff. There's my quest. Um, grab, grab the headset, stick it on. And it's so easy. Um, it, it's just, you do it in a second then, and you're there and you're in and it works and you just charge it up and there's nothing else to it. And there's something magical about that. Um, it works so well and it means the kids can play it downstairs. You can swap it between players really easily. You can move it around. You can take it with you wherever you go. It's great for showing off to people that it's quite a powerful, um, it's just a really nice way of working. So I think I'd be very surprised 
if that doesn't become the dominant form of VR because the Quest is powerful. It's still, you know, can, could be even more powerful. Clearly, it's not as powerful as a PC, but actually, it's a great starting point. And these all in one headsets are only going to get more powerful as we move forward. The chipsets, the CPUs, the GPUs are only going to get better and more powerful. So, and then, you and then imagine, you know, the cloud, the edge rendering on the cloud with 5G that they're building yeah. now, I mean, it's, that's going to be Absolutely. next level. Yeah. And 5G is exciting for me because I think they've done a lot of studies saying that the, the, the latency of 5G from when you turn your head to when it goes to your, your local server in the city and back to you is so low that actually you can do VR for the first time without that kind of horrible latency lag. And if that's, that's true, that's super powerful. And we're seeing, you know, Stadia and Microsoft and Sony all doing um, cloud-based traditional gaming. And as soon as 5G is there, and that's, that's definitely coming in now over the next few years, I think you'll see... The ability for VR headsets not to have to do all the computation on them, which means they don't need heat sinks and they don't need processors, they don't need the battery life shrink right down. And that means the form factor can be way smaller and suddenly you're getting much more towards a kind of Ray-Bans type dream that, you know, that I've got rather than a slightly more chunky headset. So I think, I think that's going to help hugely. But even before 5G and, and, and you know, uh, cloud-based uh, VR rendering comes in, you're still going to see headsets getting smaller and more all-in-one headsets that are more powerful. And you can imagine at some point, if you have a Quest-type headset that's as powerful as a Rift is now on a great gaming PC um, and is $199 or, or less, that's going to fly out of the stores. That's going to be hugely successful, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what's next for you guys? Can you, anything, anything on the horizon that you can talk about? Yeah, well, we've got four projects in development of which Phantom's the biggest and that finishes um, fairly soon actually because of the launch date is out. So we've got lots of other stuff we haven't announced. Um, a mix of consumer games, sort of big consumer titles, and we're actually doing a really interesting LBE project, um, which we can't talk about yet, but that's a very exciting big LBE. We, game might, have to, we might have to talk about that later under NDA. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we're, we're doing a mix of stuff and actually it's all working really well. So we've got, we're up to 107 people now. So we're, we're quite a big studio. You should see our wage bill every month. Jeepers, it's, it's scary. But actually it's great because we're growing, we're expanding, we're getting better all the time. And we've got four projects on the go, probably another project starting as soon as we finish Phantom. And, and we just get each time we're trying to get better. We're trying to get bigger games, better quality. We're learning all the time. And, and that's the same for every deal, I think. So, so last question, how do you feel about the location based, you know, given the, the pandemic and, and hygiene and all of that stuff, like what's your thinking around location based VR and the, and then the near term prospects, I think long term people have short memories and will solve some of those, but, but what about the more near term prospects? How are you guys feeling about that? So I'm not too worried that it will bounce back strongly when the lockdown finishes properly. Um, We've seen some data actually from China where they opened some things up and actually the issues with the LBE are case there where there were just too many people coming back and they had to slow them down. So I don't think that, and particularly because hygiene is something you can address visually. If you have some clean boxes at the front with your headsets in and you take one out, problem solved. You know, there are much worse uh, places you can go to where you're reusing helmets and other things. You know, th I think it's- Go card, ball, putting your fingers in bowling ball holes. Oh, yeah, that's a great example. Bowling balls, you know, would you want to be doing that? Uh, you know, touching things everyone else is touching, at least with a headset, it's on your head. It's not actually physically touching your eyes. I don't know. I think it'll be fine. I, I'm not worried about that because I think you can stage manage that you can show the hygiene you know a lot of a lot of great places do do the hygiene but they just don't show it and i think that'll i be call that cool. hygiene theater and i've been talking about that yeah. since 2015 2014 yeah. 2015 yeah and that's going to become even more important um the challenge i think is is when will people be able to go out you know i've heard talk of well maybe you can run an lbe or you know an arcade with a third of the people to keep that kind of social distancing but the problem is the margins were quite small you know, even getting 100%, you'd be making a bit of profit. You're going to have to 30%. You're going to have to raise your prices by three times or do something to try and make it work commercially. So I think the, the short term is going to be hard. But as soon as, the, you know, let's say a vaccine is out there and everyone's vaccinated, then I think the people that are there and survive to that point are going to be in a great place because I don't think there's going to be an issue with them taking off as well. And there's a good time now for them to figure out the challenges with what they had and to plan for how to kind of reinvigorate and reset up their spaces in the future. So there's a natural kind of breathing point where I think they can kind of go, right, we wanted to change those things, but we couldn't really because everybody was, they're all busy. Now we've got a bit of downtime. Let's come out of this and be a leader because some, some of the companies are going to drop away for sure. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. So, well, dude, I'm, I'm, I can't wait. I'm like chomping at the bit to play. So um, I'll let you get back to work and, 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 and manage the team. What you guys are doing is amazing. Pushing the envelope on the quest is exactly what the industry needs. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, and I know, I know there's a lot of us can't wait to, to, to get our kayak on. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Well, yeah, I'd love your feedback. Once you've played it and got it, yeah, do let us do let me know what you think of it, good and bad. And uh, give, me a, we'll, give me a side we'll quest build as soon as you're willing, and I'll uh, I'll okay. I'll let you know. <laughs> Brilliant. Have a great have a great time. And by the way, tell the team, um, everybody out here is rooting for them. Seriously, like the whole VR community is watching and waiting and rooting for you guys to be successful. Oh, thank you so much, Bob. That means a lot. I'll let the team know that. All right, cool. Take care. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Right, bye.